Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to lecture four of Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring course. My name is Tom Mokorosi. I am the training coordinator of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. This evening, I'll be taking you through laws 19 and 20. And then my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, will take us through laws 21, 22 and 23. After which time we shall go through the questions on the chat box that you have posed while we were presenting. I will then also activate all your cameras and microphones so that we can be interactive. And once we've gone through the questions and answers on the chat box, we will open the floor up for live questions and answers via you candidates speaking to us live. And we do encourage interaction. This evening's laws are very crucial in terms of match play in any game of cricket. And we hope that there will be a lot of engagement as to how to interpret and understand these laws. So let's get straight into it and start with law 19, which is boundaries. You'll remember that in law two, which was the umpires, we needed to determine the boundary of the field of play before the match starts. So the laws tells us that before the toss, the umpires shall determine the boundary of the field of play, which shall be fixed for the duration of the match. Very important, you cannot have in a five day test match, the boundary being 90 meters on day one and then the ground authority decides to change it to 85 meters on day two and then on day three they go to 87 meters etc the boundary needs to be exactly the same for all five days of a five-day test match or the entire duration of any cricket match uh, now you will often hear commentators talk about the short boundary and the long boundary. So because pitches are in differing places on the square of a cricket field, you do sometimes have a longer boundary on the one side than you do on the other side, depending on which strip is being used for that particular match. Um, so the boundaries don't have to be of equal length all the way around the field of play, but the boundary must be positioned in the same place throughout the match from start to finish, even in multiple day matches. The boundary shall be determined such that no part of any side screen will at any stage of the match be within the field of play. Uh, sometimes you do have boundaries that or side screens that form part of the boundary. That is perfectly fine as per law. Uh, all that law is telling us here is that the side screen cannot be inside the field of play. How do we identify and mark a boundary? Let's see what the law says. Wherever practical, the boundary shall be marked by means of a continuous white line or an object in contact with the ground. Remember that any text highlighted in green is being examined in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 online exam. So please do make note as we go through as specifically today's lectures, which are quite well examined. This is one of them. If the boundary is marked by a white line, the edge of the line nearest the pitch 
shall be considered the boundary. OK, uh, in international cricket, we often see. What's called boundary cushions in use. And. If you've ever seen the replay. To determine whether a ball has gone for four or six. If the ball hits that boundary cushion. In even on the inside of that boundary cushion, you'll remember that it's a triangle, so the one third of the triangle um, is. Angling outside the field of play, one is angling into the field of play and the other one, of course, is the base of the boundary cushion. So even if the ball hits the. The side of the. Boundary cushion triangle that is facing the field of play that is still considered a boundary six. Why? Because the boundary inside edge of that boundary cushion is where the boundary starts. So as soon as it hits any part of the cushion, that is the boundary six. OK, if it hits the ground and the cushion at the same time, uh, that will be boundary four. An object such as a flag, post or board used merely to highlight the position of a line marked on the ground must be placed beyond the boundary and is not itself to be regarded as being the boundary. I will show you in subsequent slides pictures of what this means. So here we have the indication of where the boundary starts. That triangle indicates that the inside edge of that particular white line that goes all the way across, all the way around the field, that is where the boundary starts. So it doesn't matter the thickness of the boundary line or the boundary ropes or the boundary cushions. The very inside edge of that line is where the boundary starts. If we have picket fences around the boundary, uh, the inside edge of that picket fence is where the boundary starts. If we have a rope marking the boundary, the inside edge of that rope is where the boundary starts. Uh, sometimes we've got posts, and as the law told us in the previous slide, posts and flags are often outside of the boundary, and they are actually just a visual signal to the umpires as to where the boundary is, uh, but there should always be a continuous white line along the grass, uh, which the inside edge of that line is the start of the boundary. So the start of the boundary is not where the posts are pitched. Similar with the flags, you it would be dangerous to have those flags on the inside edge of the line uh, simply because if a field is trying to field the ball close to the boundary uh, it's easier if that flag is further away so the law tells us that flags and posts need to be pitched outside of the boundary line uh, but the boundary still remains the white continuous line on the field So here again, the law tells us that if a boundary is marked by means of an object that is in contact with the ground, the boundary will be the edge of the grounded part of the object which is nearest the pitch. So the boundary cushion example that I've talked to you through is exactly what the law is referring to in this point. 
where there is no white line or object providing continuous marking, Objects such as flags, posts, or boards may be used to mark specific points on the boundary. And interestingly, the boundary shall be the imaginary straight line on the ground joining the two nearest marked points. So we've got quite a challenge here in Cape Town, especially in our underprivileged areas where um, Poverty stricken communities actually look to uh, vandalism and theft of cricket clubs. So a lot of our cricket clubs in poorer areas do not have a boundary rope simply because it gets stolen. So they do mark their boundary uh, using poles or sometimes even bricks, which is very dangerous, uh, but they don't have many options. So what the law is telling us here is if they mark the boundary using uh, bricks, say five meters away from each other, all the way around the field, the imaginary line that is the boundary connecting all the bricks is not a round line, but is a series of straight lines from brick to brick. And it is very difficult as an umpire standing 60, 70, 80 meters away in the middle of the field to judge whether a fielder has fielded the ball inside of that imaginary line or on that imaginary line or outside of that imaginary line. We have to rely on the honesty of the fielder to tell us whether or not the ball has uh, crossed the boundary or if the fielder, him or herself, touched the ball while crossing the boundary. Uh, and in that case, there would be four runs awarded to the batting side, a boundary four awarded to the batting side. Uh, we cannot trust spectators to give us uh, their opinion. Um, we do not trust players outside of the field who are watching. We have to take the word of the actual fielder who fielded the ball. It's not a perfect science and a lot of arguments have raged over the years as to the honesty of uh, some fielders, uh, but unfortunately without uh, the benefit of television replays at club cricket, uh, that is all we have is the honesty or unfortunately sometimes lack thereof of the fielder to rely on. Boundary that cannot be identified shall be determined by the umpires before the toss. So sometimes you don't have bricks and you don't have a line and you don't have flags and you don't have a picket fence. Uh, you need to make a plan. You need to maybe get cones from the coaches of the two sides and lay them out to mark a boundary. Uh, as far as possible, you need to have a visible boundary marked out somehow. Now the law talks about an obstacle within the field of play. It shall not be regarded as a boundary unless so determined by the umpires before the toss. So let me give you a common example here again in Cape Town. A lot of our school fields also double up as rugby fields and you do, do find that either you have a set of rugby poles or even soccer poles inside the field of play of the cricket field. So you need to decide Actually, you don't decide there will be a custom already at that field that is in place to decide if the ball hits 
their rugby polls on the full. Are we going to give a boundary six? Are we going to give a boundary four? Or are we just going to let play carry on and the batters must keep running for their runs? So you won't make up that rule. That rule will be in existence already because a lot of cricket matches would have been played on that field. And whatever that local custom is, will remain and shall be communicated to both captains at the toss. Obviously, you need to find out what that custom is if you are umpiring at that field for the first time. And you need to confirm it with the home captain and then communicate it to both captains at the toss. In Peter Maritzburg, which is the home city of KwaZulu Natal inland here in South Africa. They are in Cricket South Africa's Division Two provincial competitions. Um, their home ground is called the Peter Maritzburg Oval, and there is a huge tree three quarters of the way into that particular field. And I do have a video showing a SA under 19 player hitting the ball into that tree on the full and four boundary four was signaled by the umpire correctly so because that is the prevailing custom at Peter Maritzburg Oval ever since the ground started hosting cricket matches. I don't think I've got the link with me right now, but while Abdullah presents, I will get a hold of it and we can play it before the question and answer session. Person or animal coming onto the field of play while the ball is in play shall not be regarded as a boundary unless the umpires determine otherwise at the time that contact between the ball and such a person or animal is made. The decision shall be made for each separate occurrence. So this sometimes happens when the striker hits a ball along the ground and it's going for a boundary four towards the dugout where one of the teams is sitting. The players don't want the ball to bounce off the rope and into their faces. Uh, so they intercept the ball just before it hits the rope. And so the ball is actually still in play when they intercept the ball and catch it and throw it back uh, to the nearest fielder. Um, they know this is not really allowed, uh, but some players don't know the law as well as they should do. What the law is telling us here is that the bowler's end umpire shall decide. He or she may come together with the striker's end umpire to decide whether they think without that intervention, the ball would have gone to the boundary or not. And if they feel that the ball would have gone to the boundary, then they award a boundary four. Uh, similarly, if a dog runs onto the field and the ball is hit hard and it's on its way to the boundary until the ball hits the dog, then the bowler's end umpire will have to decide if need be getting assistance from the striker's end umpire whether the ball would have gone on to go to the boundary if it wasn't for the dog being hit by the ball. And if they feel that the ball would have gone on to cross the boundary, then they will award a boundary four. Okay, there is no set rule for every incident. The law tells us that the decision shall be made for each separate occurrence. Uh, so this is a picture of 
when Matthew Boast hit the ball over the boundary, but unfortunately it touched the leaves of the tree before going over the boundary and that that tree is inside of the boundary. So as mentioned, I will get a link to that video and play it for you before our question and answer session. How many runs are scored from a boundary? I'm sure we all know we've got uh, two types of boundary, a boundary six and a boundary four. Let us see how the law describes them. A boundary six will be scored if the ball has been struck by the bat. That's quite important. And is first grounded beyond the boundary without having been in contact with the ground within the field of play. This shall e apply even if the ball has previously been touched by a fielder. Um, so quite often you see fielders trying to take a catch on the boundary and they drop the catch and the ball falls over the boundary rope and boundary six is signaled. So it doesn't matter that the ball touched a fielder first before going over the rope, as long as the ball lands outside of the field of play, then it is a boundary six. But very importantly, a boundary six will only be scored if it has been struck by the bat. I'll give you an incident that happened at Dubai Tens about eight years ago now. A fast bowler was bowling and the bowler decided to bowl a short pitch delivery, commonly known as a bouncer. The striker tried to play a hook shot, uh, but missed. Instead, the ball flicked the top of the striker's helmet and went over the boundary. So what would you as an umpire signal for that piece of action? Believe it or not, you would signal four leg buys. Why leg buys? Abdullah will come to leg buys, I think, on Monday. But the ball has not been struck by a bat. It has struck the person or the protective equipment of the striker. Um, so that is why we are awarding leg buys. And it has, because it hasn't been struck by the bat, it cannot be a boundary six. So unfortunately, that batting side was awarded four leg buys. A boundary four was signaled rather than a boundary six. Everybody thought the umpire was blind or completely um, stupid, I suppose. Uh, but he was 100% correct in signaling four leg buys for that particular incident. So there the law tells us a boundary four will be scored when a ball that is grounded beyond the boundary, whether struck by the bat or not, was grounded within the boundary or has not been struck by the bat. So that's exactly the scenario I've just described to you. This ball flew from the batter's helmet all the way over the boundary rope. Um, so you would think it should be a boundary six, but because it has not been struck by the bat, it can only be a boundary four. Okay. When a boundary is scored, the batting side shall be awarded whichever is the greater of the allowance for the boundary, so either boundary four or boundary six, or the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress if they had already crossed at the instant the boundary is scored. So this is quite interesting. 
if the two batters are running before the bound the ball gets to the boundary and they have crossed for a fifth run when the ball goes over the boundary rope law tells us in this point that we would award five runs to the batting side it's not penalty runs it's runs off the bat and this is because we always award the greater of the boundary allocation or how many runs have been ran by the batters even if the fifth one wasn't complete as long as they had crossed for the fifth run before the ball crossed the boundary we would allow them to stay at those ends of the completed fifth run and five runs would be added to the batting team's total it doesn't often happen i've never seen it happen why because it would be very strange for a fielder not to get to that ball before they are able to run five or before the ball crosses the boundary. Okay. The scoring of penalty runs by either side is not affected by the scoring of a boundary. So we will touch on how penalty runs are awarded throughout the laws in the next couple of lectures. But if there are to be five penalty runs awarded for whatever reason, uh, then those still remain if the boundary has happened before the penalty runs are affected. Um, it all depends on the sequence of events. Uh, but also keep in mind that a no ball and a wide are also classified as one run penalties okay now let us move on to the contentious issue of boundary catches and we do have an example from the big bash league late last year which had opinions divided as to whether that should be a six or a four but before we get to that video let uh sorry if it, that should have been a six or uh out court but before we get to that video uh let's go and watch the laws of cricket animation and those of you who were with us in lecture one i would have told you about the app that you can download on your phones in fact i sent the links out on the course material before the course started and on the app you can find all of these animations as well boundary catching in cricket, a catch is considered to be fair if the fielder is within the field of play and the ball hasn't touched the ground before he or she catches it. The fielder must have complete control both over the ball and his or her own movement. Can a batsman be caught over the boundary? Well, this being cricket, the answer is yes and no. If the fielder catches the ball like this, with part of the body grounded outside the field of play, then the lucky old batsman is not only not out, but also scores a six. However, if in the same situation the fielder has leapt for the ball from within the boundary, but not from outside it, caught it whilst airborne over the boundary, but managed to throw it up in the air before touching the ground, he or she can then step back into the field of play to complete the catch. It doesn't matter if the fielder throws it to a teammate or completes the catch on his or her own. In this scenario, the same batsman who just scored six would in fact have been out. 
as they frequently say, it's a funny old game. For Oodles more details on this subject, take a look at Laws 19 and 33 in MCC's The Laws of Cricket. I've saw, saw Matt Renshaw do this before, and I'm pretty sure this is out. So if his feet are planted when he takes the catch again outside the rope, it's six. So if he makes the first contact from where he jumped inside the rope, and then when the last contact is made, he's back inside the rope, it's out. So as long as when he threw it up a second time, these feet were in the air, yes. the last point of contact has to be back in. So when he's outside the boundary rope, when he takes the ball again, his feet must be in the air when he throws it up again. Effectively, he could throw it up 300 times if, as long as his feet are in the air. So very well explained there by, I think, Glenn Maxwell was one of the commentators saying that the first contact with the ball needs to be from within the field of play, which it was. And the last contact with the ball needs to be with the fielder inside the field of play. And all the juggling that the fielder did outside of the field of play, he would have noticed that his feet were in the air. So law technically says he was not outside the field of play or he was not grounded outside the field of play when he made contact with the ball. And the commentator even said that he could juggle it 300 times if he wanted to, as long as each time he touched the ball, uh, his feet were not grounded outside the field of play. So according to law, that was a perfectly legitimate catch. So the arguments all over social media was that this law needs to be changed because it just looks a bit ridiculous, especially if you take into consideration the comment that was made that you could potentially juggle the ball up to 300 times as long as you are never in contact with the ground outside of the field of play when you touch the ball. So let's have one last look at it and we can discuss it further during the Q&A, but the correct decision was made of uh, out court. I've saw, saw Matt Renshaw do this before, and I'm pretty sure this is out. So if his feet are planted when he takes the catch again outside the rope, it's six. So if he makes the first contact from where he jumped inside the rope, and then when the last contact is made, he's back inside the rope, it's out. So as long as when he threw it up a second time, these feet were in the air. Yes. The last point of contact has to be back in. So when he's outside the boundary rope, when he takes the ball again, his feet must be in the air when he throws it up again. Effectively, he could throw it up 300 times if, as long as his feet are in the air. Right, so I hope that clears up the interpretation of that particular law. You might not agree with the law. Um, I certainly don't. I think it looks a little bit ridiculous that a player can handle the ball effectively physically outside of the field of play just as long as his feet are not grounded outside the field of play um, but as the law stands a perfectly legitimate catch what happens when there is an overthrow or a willful act by the fielder and the ball then goes over the boundary if the boundary results from an overthrow or from the willful act of a fielder, runs shall be scored as such. Any runs for penalties awarded to either side, as mentioned earlier in the law, they will always stand. The allowance for the boundary will stand. As, and then the runs completed by the batters along with the run in progress if they had already crossed at the instant of the throw would also count. So we've got a another video that um, also had the world talking. The famous 
uh, six that was awarded to Ben Stokes in the World Cup final, 50 over World Cup final in 2019, which came from a throw by Martin Guptill that hit Ben Stokes' bat as he was diving to make good his ground at the end of the second run, and then the ball sped off to the boundary. Um, was six the correct call in terms of the total number of runs? Um, unfortunately not. It is beautifully explained by the Cricket Digest video that we shall show soon. Hello and welcome to the Cricket Digest channel. World Cup final match saw one of the most thrilling finish ever witnessed in an ODI match. However, an overthrow in the 50th over of England innings has sparked the debate. A throw from Martin Guptill deflected after hitting Ben Stokes who was diving to save his wicket and the ball crossed the boundary line. Many people were confused about how an overthrow is valid after the ball touches the batsman. Point to be considered here is, everyone in the field including the batsman and the umpires are considered as part of the play and the fielding side has to take this into consideration. Hence, the ball getting deflected from either a batsman or an umpire will not be called a dead ball. However, if a batsman makes deliberate contact with the ball or if he deliberately comes in the way of a throw, then the ball will be immediately called dead and the batsman will be given out obstructing the field. But in the case of Ben Stokes, he had come in the way of throw, but he did not do it deliberately. He was running hard to save his wicket and he did not make deliberate contact with the ball either. It looks unfair to the fielding side in this case, but one should also take into consideration that catching after the ball hits either an umpire or a batsman is valid. Hence, allowing overthrow was well within the loss of the game. But there was a mistake committed by the umpires in this incident. They awarded 6 runs, whereas only 5 runs should have been awarded. According to Cricket Law 19.8, if the boundary results from an overthrow or from the willful act of a fielder, then the runs scored shall be allowance for the boundary, which is 4 runs in this case, and the runs completed by the batsman, plus the run in progress if the batsman had already crossed at the instant of the throw. Ben Stokes and Adil Rashid had completed the first run, but they had not crossed for the second run at the instant of the throw. Hence, only one run should have been awarded awarded for running and in total 5 runs should have been awarded. Law further states that if the batsman had not crossed at the instant of the throw, then they should be sent to the end they have left. Meaning in this case, Adil Rashid should have been sent to the striker's end and Ben Stokes should have been sent to the non-striking end for next delivery. If this law was applied properly, then the New Zealand team would have had a good chance to win the World Cup. Do you feel any different? Do let us know in the comment section. So I'm not sure how many of you while watching the World Cup final back in 2019 knew that only five runs should have been awarded for that overthrow, uh, but six were awarded. And as we mentioned in Monday's lecture, uh, scores cannot be changed once announced as final by the umpires. Um, news only came out the next morning of the error that the umpires had made, at which time it was too late to change anything. And of course, we all know England won um, the World Cup based on boundary count, because even the super over ended in a tie. Uh, one of the most incredible matches of all time. Next law I'm taking you through is the dead ball. And it's important to note that the ball can either become dead or we as umpires have to call and signal dead ball in certain incidents. So let us see the difference between when the ball automatically becomes dead and when we need to call and signal dead ball. So we first look at when the ball automatically becomes dead. 
The ball becomes dead when it is finally settled in the hands of the wicket keeper of the bowler. And the word here, the words here finally settled are for the umpires alone to decide when they feel the ball is finally settled. The ball automatically becomes dead when a boundary is scored. Nothing further can happen in that particular delivery once the ball crosses the boundary. The ball is automatically dead when a batter is dismissed. Unlike baseball, where you can have a double play and get two batters out in the same ball, in cricket, when one batter is dismissed, the ball is then dead. Whether played or not, the ball becomes trapped between the bat and person of a batter or between items of his or her clothing or equipment. The ball is then dead. Quite often, fielders who don't know this law, fielding at short leg, you'll find that against a spinner, the ball can, can sometimes ricochet off the bat and land up stuck between the flap of the pad and the thigh of the batter. And then the short leg fielder will try and run to the batter and pull the ball outside out of that flap and claim a catch because there was an inside edge that caused the ball to end up between the flap and the thigh of the batter. Decision there is quite easy for the umpire. It is not out because why? The ball became dead the instant that it got trapped between the flap of the pad and the thigh of the batter. And even though the law tells us that the ball immediately becomes dead in this particular incident, it is good umpiring practice. If you see the short leg fielder approaching the batter to try and claim the catch, just call and signal dead ball so that everybody knows the ball is dead because not all players know the law. When else does the ball immediately become dead or automatically become dead? Whether played or not, it lodges in the clothing or equipment of a batter or the clothing of an umpire. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. The ball also becomes dead when there's an award for penalty runs. When a player returns to the field without permission and comes into contact with the ball. Okay, so the player merely returning to the field without the permission of the umpires the ball is still live it's only if that player comes into contact with the ball that the ball becomes automatically dead again this is another law that very few players know so if you were to discover this has happened then you Either umpire should call and signal dead ball and then explain as to why um, the ball has become automatically dead. And we shall go through this procedure in detail in Law 24. If there's a case of illegal fielding, which we'll cover in Law 28, the ball also becomes automatically dead, but again, the players are generally not aware of these laws. So for them to know that the ball is dead, we need to call and signal dead ball. If the ball is bowled and goes past the batter, past the wicket keeper and hits the helmet lying or placed behind the wicket keeper, that belongs to the fielding side, then that 
ball also becomes automatically dead. Again, either not everyone knows this law or even if they do, not everybody will see the ball hitting the helmet behind the wicket keeper. So good umpiring practice is for either umpire when they see the ball hitting the helmet to call and signal dead ball and then follow the relevant procedure, which we will also explain in Law 28. When the match is concluded, the ball is obviously then dead. Now, million dollar question. Does the call of over or time constitute the ball dead? The answer is no, neither the call of over nor the call of time constitutes the ball dead. We should wait until the ball is dead before we call over. I've seen a very messy incident where the umpire called over while the ball was still alive and actually ended up picking the ball up himself where the batters were still not in their creases because they were trying to run, decided against the run, and were now going back to their original ends. Uh, before they got back to their original ends, the umpire called over and then proceeded to pick the ball up. And the fielding side were livid with him because they had an opportunity to run out either batter uh, which was basically snuffed by the umpire calling over and picking the ball up. So please, ladies and gents, don't be in a rush to call over. Um, wait until the ball is dead before you call over. And if it's the end of a session, then you call over and time. This is where our interpretation uh, is key. The ball shall be considered to be dead when it is clear to the bowler's end umpire that the fielding side and both batters at the wicket have ceased to regard the ball as in play. And whether the ball is finally settled or not is a matter for the umpire to decide. Okay. So a fielding side cannot tell you that, ah, oh, but Umpy, the ball was still live. A batting side can't tell you that, oh, but Umpy, I thought the ball was dead. You need to consider by their body language whether both the batting and the bowling sides have considered the ball dead before you can consider the ball dead. Okay. So we've gone through all of the times when the ball becomes automatically dead. Now the law shall tell us about when to call and signal dead ball. Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when intervening in a case of unfair play. We often need to chat to the offending player and their captain. Best if both umpires are involved in that conversation. So call and signal dead ball and then you go to your partner and you go to the offending player and their captain. Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when there is a possibility of a serious injury to a player or an umpire. Okay, you don't have to wait for somebody to scream or to fall over. If either umpire considers that there is a chance of a serious injury or a serious injury or a, an event has occurred that could possibly be a serious injury, then call and signal dead ball immediately. Player safety is always paramount in our decision making. 
be the umpire shall call and signal dead ball when leaving his or her position for consultation. We shall also call and signal dead ball when one or both bales fall from the striker's wicket before the striker has had the opportunity of playing the ball. Note that it's only if the bales from fall from the striker's wicket that we call and signal dead ball. If the bales fall from the bowler's end wicket, so the non-striker's wicket, we can let the ball be delivered um, if they were just blown off by wind. But if the striker is distracted and moves away, um, then law 20.4.2.5 applies. If the striker is not ready for the delivery of, of the ball, and delivered makes no attempt to play it, provided the umpire is satisfied that the striker had adequate reason for not being ready, the ball shall not count as one of the over and we shall call and signal dead ball. This is actually the law that applies to the example that I gave. If and when the striker is distracted by any noise or movement or in any other way while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery, this shall apply whether the source of the distraction is within the match or outside. The ball shall not count as one of the over. If there is an instant instance of a deliberate attempt to distract the striker, then we shall call and signal dead ball and the ball shall not count as one of the over. This is whether it is before the ball is bowled or after the ball has bowled, has been bowled. I've seen this happen a few times over the years. If the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery, call and signal dead ball. If the bowler throws the ball towards the striker's end before entering his or her delivery stride, call and signal dead ball. If the ball does not leave the bowler's hand for any reason other than an attempt to run out the non-striker, then call and signal dead ball. I mentioned on Monday that the lost ball law has now been incorporated into the dead ball law. This is where the incorporation happens. 20.4.2.11 20 says, if either umpire is satisfied that the ball still in play, cannot be recovered, he or she shall call and signal dead ball. So I use the example of a snake on the field and the ball being hit towards the snake and no fielders are brave enough to go and retrieve the ball with the snake close to it, then the either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. Um, it won't be rebold, but any runs uh, completed before the call of dead ball will stand, as well as the run in progress if they had crossed when the umpire called and signaled dead ball. If either umpire considers that either side has been disadvantaged by a person, animal or other object within the field of play, then you can call and signal dead ball. However, I mentioned this earlier in the boundaries law, if both umpires consider the ball would have reached the boundary 
if it was not for the intervention of the external person or animal, then the boundary will stand. And in the cases that I mentioned, you do not call and signal dead ball. You only call and signal dead ball if either side is disadvantaged from the intervention by the external person or the animal. If the striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his or her person, whether grounded or raised, remains within the pitch, then we need to call and signal dead ball. Quiz question. Abdullah mentioned it last week, Monday in the first lecture, the width of a pitch in meters. What is the width of a a pitch please punch it into your chat box and let's see who has been revising their measurements because we mentioned in the first lecture there are 10 marks in the exam which are examined for the pitch and crease names and markings so what is the width of the pitch and the reason I ask is because if a striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his or her person, whether grounded or raised, remains within the pitch, then the bowler's end umpire, who's in the best position to see this, will call and signal dead ball. So what is the width of a cricket pitch? Please enter your answer now in the chat box. And then a catch all clause. If either umpire is required to call and signal dead ball under any of the laws not included above, we shall call and signal dead ball. And we will come to in the next law, which is no ball, uh, one or two scenarios where you need to call and signal no ball and immediately thereafter call and signal dead ball. So there are more instances instances where we need to call and signal dead ball, which are not listed above. This is a incident that happened in the Big Bash League a few years ago now. It is a playing condition, not in law, but just another example of when we can call and signal dead ball. 40 runs, uh, get yourself in, have a chance to play in the innings. Make sure that you're you're in the campaign, but have respect to each Over the top, he has crunched that. That has gone a long way. I actually didn't get to the grandstand because it hit one of the piles. It didn't hit the roof. It just hit one of the beams coming down off the roof. That's how well he hit. That has gone a long way. So Aaron Finch has absolutely monstered that delivery. 
but because of the playing condition that exists in the Big Bash League, if a ball hits any part of the roof, it shall not count as one legal delivery in the over and will be called dead ball, regardless of which part of the roof it hit and where the ball was likely to end up. But please remember, this is a playing condition just for your interest and not examined in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 exam and is not a law for dead ball. 40 runs. That is me for this evening. I'm going to hand over to Abdullah now to take us through uh, no ball. And if there's time, he will take us through uh, wides and buys and leg buys. Over to you, Abdullah. Thank you so much, Tom. Good evening to you and good evening to the rest of the attendees. I'm kicking off with the noble law. And before we dive into the noble law, the, the nobles that we will be discussing under this law is nobles as per the laws um, of cricket. There are other instances of nobles that are covered uh, by playing conditions. Uh, example, in, in uh, limited over crickets, 50 or 20 over cricket, there are noble, there are restrictions with the amount of fielders inside the circle and, and, um, and fielders on the boundary. So under playing conditions, uh, there are um, playing conditions covering uh, that and um, at times nobles will be called. But for the purpose of this course, we are covering nobles as per the laws of cricket. The mode of delivery. It is important for the umpire before uh, the bowler s s begins his or her over. The umpire needs to ask the bowler whether the bowler is right or left handed and whether the bowler is bowling over or around the wicket. Why is this important to ask? You, the umpire, needs to inform the striker of this. In the next slide, we will, uh, I will show you by pictures what is meant by over or around the wicket. But importantly, for the bowler bowls, ask the bowler, you left or right, and are you going over or around the wicket, and then inform the striker. If the bowler changes his or her mode of delivery, by either the bowler tells you I'm bowling left-handed and then suddenly without informing you, the umpire, that the bowler suddenly bowls the ball with his or her right hand, that is changing the mode of delivery. In that case, the umpire needs to call and signal no ball. Under the laws of cricket, underarm bowling shall not be permitted. There are certain formats where it is uh, permitted, but those are special agreements um, set up by the governing body, uh, but otherwise underarm bowling not permitted. The law is also clear that the bowler is not allowed to throw the ball. And we will see in later slides um, what happens or what the umpires needs to do when the bowler do throw the ball. Okay, earlier I spoke about the mode of, of delivery. We will start with the uh, picture on the left-hand side uh, first. So if you can visualize uh, the first picture, from, I will start from left to right. So the first picture, this is a right-handed bowler. And if you can visualize this, where the arrow is pointing, that's where the striker is standing. So the bowler coming uh, from that side, the bowler will be bowling around the wicket. So if you're able to see my, my cursor, this is where the bowler is uh, is running from. And one of the methods that I that I uh, um, look at whether a bowler is bowling right hand uh, around or over the wicket. So if where my cursor is, is where the stumps is, I look at the bowler's hand 
if the the hand uh, that the ball is in is further away from the stumps, then the bowler is bowling around the wicket. If the hand is closer, the hand that the ball is in is closer to the stumps, the bowler is then bowling over the wicket. So if you, again, picture on the left hand side, the first one, if you can visualize this is a right hand bowler, ball in his, uh, in his uh, right hand, the bowler is now coming from this side. So you do not look at the batter. Don't look at the striker, whether it's a striker's left-handed or right-handed. That's irrelevant. You, all you do is you look at the bowler. You look at which hand the ball is in. And if the bowler, this is a right-handed bowler coming from this side, where my arrow is pointing, if the bowler is coming from this side, you will, if you can visualize it, you will see that the ball that the hand is in the right hand is further away from the wicket. That means the bowler is bowling right, right arm around the wicket. You will then inform the striker if the bowler tells you, um, I'm right-handed and I'll be bowling around the wicket. You will then inform the striker of this. Second picture from your left, also a right-handed bowler. In this instance, the, bowl, uh, the bowler will be bowling over the wicket. Again, if you can visualize, ball will be in the right hand because it's a right-handed bowler. Which arm is closer to the wicket? So if you can visualize this, visualize a bowler running in, you'll see that the, the right hand is closer to the stumps. So in this case, the bowler is bowling a right arm over the wicket. Same principle, same principle applies to the left-handed bowler. Again, you apply the same principle. Uh, in the third picture from your left, if you can visualize, the ball will now be in the left hand. And if the bowler is coming from this side, the left hand will be the, the hand that's further from the wicket. The right hand will be closer to the wicket, so the left hand will be further from the wicket. The bowler is then, then bowling left arm around the wicket. Looking at the other, uh, the last um, picture, you'll see this is left arm over the wicket. Visualize the left arm will be closer to the wicket. That is how I remember where the bowler is bowling over or around the wicket. So what happens if a bowler throws the ball or the bowler de delivers the ball underarm? What action does, and does the umpire umpires needs to take? So if, in the opinion of either umpire, the ball is thrown or delivered underarm, either umpire to call and signal no ball. The bowlers in umpire then shall give the bowler first and final warning for either bowling uh, underarm or throwing the ball. This warning to apply throughout the innings. You will then inform everyone, inform the captain, inform, inform both captains, inform the, the batters of this. If in that same innings, that same bowler either throws the ball again or delivers the ball underarm, either umpire again to call and signal no ball, but now there's additional action to take. You've already given the bowler when when you see did it the first time, first and final warning. It's now a second time in this in the same innings. Now you need to tell the captain of the fielding side, please suspend this bowler. This bowler is not allowed to bowl again in this particular inning. So it was the first innings. Bowler is not allowed to bowl again in the first innings. If there are further balls to be bowled in that particular over, it needs to be completed by another bowler. And then also to inform everyone. So what happens if a bowler throws the ball towards the striker before del entering his or her delivery stride? So if you can just visualize this, the bowler at the top of his or her run up let's say taking one or two steps, and then suddenly, after taking two steps, throwing the ball towards the striker. What should you do as the umpire? Umpire should call and signal dead ball if that should happen. So this is a bowler throwing 
the ball towards the striker before the striker, uh, before the bowlers entered his or her delivery stride. Fair delivery, when it comes to the feet, and this is an important uh, par uh, part of the umpire's duties every single week, when it comes to the feet, you, you need to know exactly how to handle and what to look out for. So when it comes to the feet, it's either there's, uh, when a bowler delivers a ball, it's uh, the bowler's front foot and there's the back foot. When it comes to the back foot, the crease that is associated with the back foot is the return crease. And the law tell us, so when it comes to the back foot, the back foot should not touch the return crease. When it comes to the front foot, which crease is associated with the front foot? The popping crease. So the law tell us when it comes to the front foot, the front foot must land with some part of the foot, whether it's grounded or raised, it should be behind the popping crease. So when it comes to the back foot, the crease associated with it is the return crease, and the front foot, the crease associated with it is the popping crease. So back foot should not touch the return crease, front foot, must have some part of the foot, whether that foot is grounded or raised, it should, there must be some part behind the popping crease. Also, there must be some part of the foot, whether grounded or raised, on the same side of the imaginary line joining the two middle stumps. There is a picture um, in a few slides time that will clearly illustrate bullet point number two. So let's look at a few uh, pictures. Again, when it comes to the the uh, back foot, which crease is, is associated with the back foot? The return crease. So what question do you need to ask yourself? Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? If your answer to that question is yes, then that is a no ball. If the answer to that question is no, then it's a fair or a legal delivery. So this is a right-handed um, right bowler bowling over the wicket. So let's start with the, uh, with the back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes, the back foot is touching the return crease. In this case, this is a no ball because the back foot is touching the return crease. Let's start with the back foot again. Is there any part of the back foot? Whether uh, uh, is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, there's no part of the back foot touching the return crease. That is a fair delivery. If you go to the front foot, wh wh which line or which crease is associated with the front foot? The popping crease. So what question do you ask yourself when it comes to the front foot? Is there any part of the front foot, whether grounded or raised, behind the popping crease? And the answer to that question is yes, the, actually the whole foot is behind the, the popping crease. So we're happy with the front foot as well. So this is a fair delivery. Let's start with the back foot. This is now a left arm bowler bowling around the wicket. Back foot. Which line is, uh, which crease is associated with the back foot, the return crease? Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No. So we're happy with the back foot. Let's look at the front foot. Is there any part of the front foot, uh, whether grounded or raised, behind the popping crease? Yes, there is. So this is a fair delivery. Did you start with the front foot? Which crease is associated with the front foot? The popping crease. Is there any part of the front foot with a grounded or raised behind the popping crease? Yes, there's quite a big portion behind the popping crease, so that's so we're happy with the front foot. Let's look at the back foot. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? Yes, that's why this is a noble. Back foot, any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, we're happy with the back foot. Front foot. Is there any part of the front foot 
whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease. Yes, you can see there is still a portion behind the popping crease. And when looking at the, the popping crease, do you look at the, the front edge of the line or the back edge of the popping crease? You need to look at the back edge when, when deciding whether there's a, a part of the foot, whether grounded or raised behind the popping crease. So at the, the back edge of the line, yes, there is a, a portion of the front foot behind the back edge. So that's why this is a fair delivery. For back foot, any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No, we're happy with the back foot. Front foot, is there any part of the front foot, whether grounded or raised, behind the back edge of the popping crease? No, there's not. That's why this is a no ball, because there's no part of the front foot, uh, whether grounded or raised, behind the popping crease. Back foot, no part touching the return crease? Happy. Front foot, is there any part of the front foot grounded to raise behind the popping crease? No, there's not. That's why this is a no ball. Is there any part of the back foot touching the return crease? No. Any part of the front foot, whether grounded or raised behind the back edge of the popping crease? Yes, this foot is raised, but you can see there is a, po a portion of the heel behind the popping crease. That's why this is a fair delivery. Back foot, nothing touching the return crease. We're happy with the back foot. Front foot, any part of the front foot with the ground that raised behind the popping crease? No, this not. That's why this is a no ball. Importantly, what you need to judge, especially what the front foot is, you need to judge first impact when the foot lands. There are occasions when the, when the front foot will land and then on impact, it will then slide forward. It's important, do not judge where the foot ends up. It's important that you judge it when the front foot lands and that, that is where you make your call. That is where you ask yourself the question, is there any part of the front foot upon first landing with the ground or raised behind the popping crease? If the answer to that question when it first landed is yes, there is a part, then that is a fair delivery. Do not um, look at it where it ends up because the, at times bowlers will land with the uh, with the front foot uh, behind um, the popping crease and then upon impact the front foot will then slide and ends up let's say like in this picture so do not look at where it end up you will need to look at look at it when it first lands and upon first landing if the east part of the front foot with the ground to raise behind the popping crease, then it's a fair delivery. Earlier we we spoke about that imaginary line between between the middle stump. So if you can just visualize this, this is a left arm um, spin bowler bowling from left arm over the the wicket. So if this is yes your your stumps yes the middle stump. So if you can draw an imaginary line from middle stump to middle stump. So if this uh, bowler left arm over lands with his or her front foot on this side of the imaginary line, like in this year, you need to call no ball because this is seen as per the law as the bowler changing mode of delivery. The bowler indicated that he or she is bowling over the wicket, by it. but if this happens with the foot on this side of the, uh, the um, imaginary line from middle stump to middle stump, it gets seen as if the bowler is now changed mode by bowling around the wicket. So what happens if a bowler breaks the wicket while delivering the ball. The law tells us that if the bowler, and we're now not referring here to when the bowler tries to run out uh, the non-striker, that is something else, and we will deal with that under the mode of dismissals in, uh, in a later lecture. But this is a bowler running in, and while running in, that bowler breaks the wicket with any part 
of his or her person, whether it's the hand, whether it's the foot, whether it's the knee, whether it's arm, any part. If that happens, Paula breaks the wicket, either umpire to call and signal no ball. That includes any piece of clothing or any other object that falls from the bowler and it, that piece of, uh, that piece of uh, uh, object or clothing falls onto the, onto the wicket and actually breaks the wicket. You see these days many bowlers bowling with uh, a towel behind the, uh, the backs just to some of them have sweaty palms. They keep the towel there to, to rub their hands um, just to get rid of the sweat. So now by placing the towel behind uh, the back and if that bowler running in delivers the ball, that towel then falls uh, um, from the back and it falls onto the wickets, dislodging the bells, either umpire to call and signal no ball. What happens if a ball bounces more than once or it rolls along the ground before reaching the popping crease? The law tell us if a ball bounces more than once before reaching the popping crease, either umpire to call and signal no ball. Also, uh, ball gets delivered and it rolls along the ground before reaching the popping crease, either umpire to call and signal no ball. So the important thing here is it needs to bounce more than once, or it needs to bounce for a second time before reaching the popping crease. Or if it starts, if it bounces once and it starts rolling along the ground towards the striker, either umpire to call and signal no ball. Also, for ball that was delivered, that ball either pitches totally off the pitch or even partially off the pitch before reaching the line of the striker's wicket. Bowlers in umpire to call and signal no ball. So what happens if the ball, the ball was delivered and now the striker leaves the pitch to actually play at the ball or the ball was delivered and it actually stops or comes to rest in front of the striker's wicket. The law tell us that the umpire to call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. So, the, so in this law, it stops before reaching the striker's wicket. The ball was delivered and it actually stops before reaching the striker's wicket. Immediately call no ball and immediately after that call and signal dead ball. It needs to be uh, quick after each other. It, you call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. Within a split second, you need to do these two calls. Also, if the striker needs to leave the pitch to play at the ball, similarly, call and signal no ball and immediately call and signal dead ball. What happens if a fielder intercepts a ball that was delivered? An example here is, if you can visualize this, uh, spinner bowling and you have a um, sword or silly point standing in front of, of uh, the batter. So the ball now gets delivered and the ball before reaching the, 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 the striker or before it passes the striker's wicket, it actually makes contact with that silly point fielder. The law tell us immediately call and signal no ball and split second later, call and signal dead ball. What happens if a ball bounces over head height of the striker? According to the laws of cricket, if that happens, either umpire to call and signal no ball. According to the laws of cricket. Under playing conditions in many of our, uh, our competitions, whether it's test or even uh, limited over cricket, they do treat this differently. But according to the laws of cricket, if a ball, 
if a ball bounces over the head height of the striker, you don't bounce the call-in signal. No ball. There are other forms of no balls as well, according to the laws. Um, and we'll cover it in later laws and we'll see a few pictures um, in further slides. The position of the keeper, a limitation on onside fielders, fielders encroaching the pitch. These three laws we, we will see in, in, in three pictures that follows after this. Uh, under law 41, they are also dangerous and unfair short pitch deliveries, non-pitching non, non -pitching deliveries, deliberate front foot no balls. These are also no ball infringements. If the keeper takes the ball in front of the stumps, keeper needs to wait until the ball passes the stumps, then the keeper can break it. If this happens, this is called encroachment by the wicket keeper. The strikers in umpire to call and signal no ball. According to the laws of cricket, they are only allowed a maximum of two fielders behind the popping crease on the leg side. There's no limitation on the offside. And if, uh, if you can just visualize, this is a right-handed uh, uh, batsman. The, uh, according to the laws of cricket, maximum of two fielders behind the popping crease on the leg side. There's no limitation on the offside. If you look at this pick, you'll see the law tell us not more than three, um, a maximum of two fielders allowed behind the popping crease on the leg side. In this picture, you can see there are three fielders behind the popping crease on the leg side of this left uh, on this right-handed uh, batsman. Um, looking at looking at the umpire, there's a bit of uh, umpiring technique. If this happens uh, uh, to you and you see lots of fielders uh, around the bat, and you can actually see that the 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 short leg fielder with the helmet on is actually this uh, um, in the way of the strikers in umpire. But I mean, this picture was just for for uh, uh, um, educational purposes. But good umpiring technique is if if you see this. Go stand on the other side. If there's lots of fielders blocking your view, rather go stand on the off side than on the on, uh, on side. But max two fielders allowed behind the popping crease on the leg side. When it comes to encroachment by a fielder, fielders shall not get onto the pitch until either the ball passes the bat or the ball touches the bat or the person of the batter. So this is not uh, allowed that you need to ask the fielder just to move uh, two, um, two or three uh, um, paces backwards. The field is not allowed to be on the pitch. And the umpire to re shall revoke the call of no ball if dead ball is called. If, for example, the bowler oversteps with the front foot, you call no ball, but then the bowler does not deliver the ball. In that case, you need to revoke your call of no ball. If there's a no ball over wide in the same delivery, who is the boss? No ball is boss. No ball and wide of the same delivery. You're not going to give from that delivery a no ball and a wide. No ball will be boss, so you will call and signal no ball. No ball to override the call of wide at any time. Ball does not become dead on the call of no ball. So if you call no ball, the batsman hit the ball through the covers and they start running, that ball is still alive. Yes, you've called no ball, but the ball is still alive. What is the penalty for a no ball? According to the laws, one run penalty. And that once you've called no ball, that penalty will always stand. No ball shall not count as one of the over. How can you be dismissed of a no ball? Three ways. Hit the ball twice, obstructing the field, or run out. These are the ways that you can be dismissed of a no ball. The white ball 
So according to the laws of cricket, how do you judge a wide? And again, for the purpose of this course, we're covering how to interpret or how to judge a wide in more day cricket. No, um, in in one in limited over cricket, whether it's 20 overs or 50 overs, um, you'll see there are playing conditions in place, and you'll actually see on the uh, on the pitch there are wide markings to assist the umpires to consistently uh, call wides. Those wide markings are, are just there to help the umpires consistently call it. But those are you'll um, there there are specific measurements for those um, wide the markings, but those are playing conditions that was added. But according to the laws of cricket in modern cricket, this is how you judge a wide. So what do you judge? You need to judge striker standing in a normal batting position. And you need to judge whether the ball would have passed wide of the striker standing in a normal batting position. That is how you judge a wide in according to the laws of cricket. Would the ball have passed pass wide of the striker standing in a normal batting position? The law goes further it, and it, it clarifies what is passing wide of the striker. The law tells us the interpretation of passing wide of the striker is the ball will be considered passing wide of the striker unless it is sufficiently within reach for the striker to be able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot. So that is how you judge a wide in uh, according to the laws of cricket. Would it have passed wide of the striker standing in a normal, uh, a normal batting position? Or, um, and what is passing wide? Is it sufficiently within reach of the striker to be to eat it by the means of a normal cricket shot? If yes, the striker would have been able to 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 eat it by the means of a normal uh, cricket shot, standing in a normal batting position. You won't call that a wide. If no, you need to call it uh, wide. If the umpire judges a delivery to to be wide. The umpire needs to call and signal wide when the ball passes the striker's wicket. So you call and signal wide and you need to wait until it passes the striker's wicket. Don't call it uh, too early. Sometimes the the bat, uh, the striker can play a late uh, late cut. Play, uh, play Sometimes they play it out of the keeper's hand. If, let's say if it's the keeper standing up to a spinner playing a late cut. So rather wait till it passes the striker's uh, wicket, call and signal wide, and then you'll do, um, you will again signal wide to the scorers once the ball is dead. The re revoking a call of wide ball, the umpire to revoke the call of wide ball if there's been any contact between the ball and the striker's bat or person before coming the ball coming into contact with any fielder. That's why it's important. You don't want to be revoking a wide call. Rather, Delay it for a split second. Don't call it uh, too early. You don't want to call it too early. And then the ball makes contact with the striker's pad or the bat. So when will delivery not be a wide? Sometimes the striker by moving. And the striker by moving brings the ball sufficiently within reach to be able to hit the ball by the means of a normal cricket shot. If the striker moves and then the, the bowler ball slightly wide, but yes, is he slightly wide of the striker, but in according to your opinion, the striker is still able to hit it by the means of a normal cricket shot, you shall not call that a wide. Ball does not become dead on the call of wide, what is the penalty for wide? Penalty of one run shall be awarded at the instant of a wide ball call, and that penalty will always stay. So runs resulting from the wide, how are they scored? All runs completed by the batters, or if there is a boundary, together with the penalty for the wide shall be scored as wide balls. So let's say the bowler balls are wide 
and it goes over the boundary. How many in total? You'll signal Y to the scorers, you'll wait for acknowledgement. You'll signal boundary 4 to the scorers and wait for acknowledgement and just then signal wide again to this, uh, the scorers just to emphasize that it is a wide. So in total, it will be one run for the wide and four, uh, four as well. In total, five runs will be added to the, to the score and those will be debited against the bowler. Wide do not count as one for the over. How can you put this to be this missed of a wide? Eat wicket is one. Obstructing the field is another one. There are two more. Run out. And lastly, stumped. Again, these are highlighted in, in, um, in green. So there is an exam question on this. So there are four ways that you can be dismissed of a white. I just have a few more slides, almost done. Last law for the evening. Buys. So how does the law see, or how do you interpret buys in cricket? So if a ball gets delivered, and the first criteria that needs to be in place, it should not touch anything, whether it's the bat of the striker or the person of the striker. That's the first and important thing that needs to be in place. It should not be touching anything, not the bat of the striker, nor the person of the striker. If that is the case, it didn't touch the bat of the striker, nor the person, and the batters then run. The keeper misses the ball, and the batters run. Those are seen as biased. It's important, should not be touching bat or person of the striker. Irrelevant whether a shot was played or not, the only criteria when it comes to bias is it should not have touched either the bat or the person of the striker. Lots of uh, players think, oh, I didn't offer a shot. Uh, he cannot run buys. It's not the criteria that needs to be in place. All you need to ask yourself is, did the ball that was delivered touch the bat of the striker or the person of the striker? If your answer to that question is, no, he didn't touch the bat nor the person, the batters are allowed to run. So those runs, if they, if they ran three, those will be uh, seen as buys, or if it goes over the boundary, it will be seen as buys. So those are buys, didn't touch bat or person. Leg buys. So now, the now, and what is the difference between buys and leg buys? Now here, the ball strikes or touches the person or the protective equipment of the striker. But there are two criteria in place that, uh, that, uh, that there are two things that needs to be in place for you to allow leg bias, and we'll cover it now. But when it comes to leg bias, it either needs to strike the person or the protective equipment of the striker. So if it strike any part of the person, whether it's the pads, the foot, Anywhere, the, the arm, the tummy, the bum, anywhere strikes it, the batters are allowed to take leg buys, but there's two things that needs to be in place and we'll get there now. Or if it touches any part of the protective equipment of the striker, let's say it goes against the helmet as well and it ricochets to fine leg, leg buys can be taken. But two things, there's two criteria that needs to be in place for leg buys to be taken. First one, the, the striker had to make an attempt to play the ball with his or her bat. There needs to be a, a, an attempt to play the ball. If that was in place and it goes against the pad and the ricochets to fine leg and the batters run, you'll allow, you'll allow it. The second one is if the striker tried to avoid being hit by the ball, example of this short ball, striker ducks, goes against uh, the helmet, then ricochets towards fine leg, or goes against the shoulder and ricochets towards 
uh, fine lick. Strike the batters are allowed to run because lo because in the, that instance the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. So these are the two things that needs to be in play in play for leg pass to be awarded. Must be an attempt to play at the ball or striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. That the case, they can run leg buys. And if the delivery is a no ball, that one run penalty for the no ball shall count. So if, they, if it's a no ball and they ran two leg buys and they met the criteria in bullet point one or two, you'll give the no ball and the two leg buys of three in total. So now we know what leg bias is. So we know the, uh, the two criteria that needs to be in place. Must have attempted to play the ball with the bat or try to be avoid being hit by the ball. So what happens if we, we, we just uh, uh, um, discuss the criteria that needs to be in place for leg bias to be awarded? Now what happens if the, if the striker did not attempt to play the ball with his or her bat? nor did the striker try to avoid being hit by the ball. The law guides us here. The law tell us now, if those two criteria is not being met, leg bias should not be awarded. So if the striker does not offer a shot, meaning there was no attempt to play the ball with his or her bat, or if the striker did not try to avoid being hit by the ball, and leg bias should not be awarded. If the striker sold his arms and the ball ricochets to, to the fine leg boundary, the ball, the law tell us that don't call dead ball uh, immediately. The law actually tell us you need to call and signal dead ball if the striker doesn't offer a shot and they do run. But the law guides us. You shouldn't call it immediately. You need to wait until one run, until the batters completes one run or the ball goes over the boundary. So don't call dead ball immediately. If the striker didn't offer a shot and they run, don't call dead ball immediately. Wait until they complete their first run. You need to give the fielding side an opportunity to run out either of uh, the batters. That's why you need to wait till they complete one run or until the ball goes over the boundary. So once they've now, let's say in the case, they've completed one run, now the law tell us as soon as they've completed one run, call and signal dead ball. And that one run will not count because the bat has not um, offered a shot. So you'll disallow all the runs. You also now need to send the batters back to the original end. If they, if they ran a single, you tell the striker, you call and signal dead ball, you'll disallow the runs and you tell the striker, go back to the original in. Thank you so much, Tom. That, is, that are my laws for the evening. I'm now handing back over to you to facilitate the Q&A session. Thanks very much, Abdullah. Before we go on to our question and answer session, I did promise the candidates that I would play the video of Matthew Boast hitting a massive shot over the tree at Peter Maritzburg Oval, but unfortunately for him, it brushed the leaves of the tree, which is inside the boundary at Peter Maritzburg Oval. And the custom at that ground is that we need to signal boundary four. Um, so Abdullah, I am sharing the screen of YouTube. Can you see YouTube on my screen? Before I play the video. No, Tom, I don't see anything yet. Okay, I'm going to unshare and share again. I'll share my entire screen this time. Okay, yes, now I can see your screen, Tom. Okay, lovely, thank you. I'm gonna play the video and the commentators also give a very dis good description of what happens here. Here we go, let's go, guys. 
But it might only be four if it cut, touches the tree. <laughs> That's the biggest <laughs> four you'll ever see. Just over. I'm going to cut the trees that, down here. That's a that hundred meter four. <laughs> Abdullah, is the sound coming through on your side? Uh, yes, Tom, I, I can hear the commentary. Thank you. <laughs> the tree is down, brother. <laughs> the best part is when you the analysts do the projection like they do in golf, it will be showing a carry of 110 meters, but it's, <laughs> it's, <only four. laughs> it's the biggest four I've seen. I mean, uh, Post really is coming and he's, he's really well, taking uh, the Bring me back. So unfortunately, it's not easy to see the ball hitting the tree, but uh, the commentators did say that it's gone over the boundary, but before it went over the boundary, it hit the tree. And as per the custom at that particular ground, Peter Metzberg Oval, boundary four was correctly signaled by the umpire. The batters were uh, not very amused, but uh, they do remember that in the pre-match chat between the umpires and the captains that it was confirmed that boundary four will be signaled if the ball hits the bound hits the tree either on the full or while it's rolling so make sure you know the customs or ask about the custom if there is any obstacle inside the boundary as to how to deal with it. Right, now we're going to uh, allow cameras to be activated and we're going to have an interactive Q&A session. I'm also going to allow for microphones to be activated, uh, but please, ladies and gents, uh, stay on mute until you are given the go ahead to unmute your microphone and we shall go through the questions and answers uh, together firstly in the chat box and then if there are any further questions you can raise your virtual hand and we shall give the floor to you to ask a question so let me scroll uh, right to the top of the chat box for today's questions. Uh, first question is from Edward. If a boundary four has been hit and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side, do they get nine runs? Uh, Abdullah, I read that question while you were presenting, and I was trying to think of a scenario where a boundary four would be hit and five penalty runs would be awarded to the batting side. Because normally when five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side, it is while the ball is still within the field of play, so uh, the ball hasn't got to the boundary yet. Um, the only scenario I could think of is if the ball goes over the boundary and the fielder who is going to retrieve the ball outside of the field um, wastes time and the fielding side is already on a first and final warning for time wasting and then the umpires can award five penalty runs to the batting side for time wasting by the fielding side. So yes, in that scenario, you would get four runs for the boundary being scored, plus five penalty runs for the fielding side wasting time. So nine runs would be added to the uh, batting team's total. I see you nodding your head there, Abdullah. So I'm going to move swiftly to the next question. There are a lot of questions in the chat box this evening, which is exciting. Uh, so let's move swiftly along. Mark asks, must the helmet placed by the fielding team be directly behind the stumps? I have seen umpires stop the game if it is marginally out of place. Abdullah, can you take that one for us, please? Mark, answered your question is yes, the law actually guide us. The law tells us that the 
the helmet must be placed when not in use by the fielding side and the only place that it can be put is behind the wicket keeper and the Lord used the words it must be in line with the stumps so and why why um, must it be in line with the stumps um, it actually helps the fielding side because if it's in line with the stumps who's directly behind the stumps now I would say nine ninety nine percent of the time the ball would then not hit the helmet I've seen I've seen instances where it actually does it goes against the keeper's uh, foot and then ricochets onto the helmet behind the keeper so not uh, not impossible uh, but it needs to be placed behind the the keeper and yes good umpiring technique if you do not see it in line just ask the keeper or or the slip or any of the fielders just to move it and to make sure that it is in line or directly behind the stumps over tom perfect thanks tula and uh, next question is from hitesh and this question was posted while I was presenting the dead ball law and you actually covered it perfectly in the no ball law, Abdullah. Uh, the question is, the bowler while delivering the ball drops the towel attached to the back of his trousers and dislodges a bell in the process. What should the umpire do? Call or signal dead ball or call or signal no ball? I'm sure you will all remember from what Abdullah has taught us this evening that any part of the bowler's person or equipment that dislodges the bales in his delivery stride will be called a noble. Okay, so pretty straightforward there, Hitesh. Your answer, your question was answered by Abdullah during his presentation. Next question, in law 20, when the batter is dismissed, the ball becomes dead. But there is an appeal, then the umpires call time after the appeal to consult whether out or not out. Abdullah, do you want to take that one or should I give my opinion first. Yeah, I'll take it Tom and then you can add uh, you can add if you think um, yeah, anything needs to be. Perfect. So my interpretation of what Tamil is uh, is is asking is that so the better the better is dismissed. So you've covered it as soon as a better is dismissed, the ball then immediately uh, becomes dead. So anything that happens after that is uh, is irrelevant. So whether it's you give the batter at LBW or the batter is bold, as soon as the batter is dismissed, the ball becomes dead. I think what Tamil is uh, referring to is um, if umpires needs to consult, like an example of whether there's a fair catch, whether the ball clearly carried. So Tamil, in that instance, so the um, uh, and if I can give a scenario, a bowler delivers the ball, the the ball um, better hits the getter edge, ball flies to second slip. The bowlers then blocking the the bowlers in umpire's view, and he or she could not see whether the ball carried to second slip. So in that instance, the law allows for the bowlers in umpire to go and consult with the strikers in umpire. So the, pra the practice that you follow is you call and signal dead ball. You ask for the ball from the fielding side. You now go over to your uh, colleague, the strikers in umpire, and you now consult and ask whether the ball carried or not. If the answer to the, the question is yes, it clearly carried, you then give the batter out. If the answer to is no, it did not carry, you'll then give the batter not out. And that's my interpretation of the question. Tom, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, Abdullah, what confuses me is the fact that 
Samuel says uh, the batter is dismissed and the ball is dead, which is 100% correct. Then he is. Then he says there is an appeal. Um, I'm not sure why there would be an appeal after the batter is dismissed. Uh, is it maybe a review for uh, DRS? Um, Tamil, if you're around, uh, please raise your hand and we can maybe let you rephrase your question. Uh, but I'm going to go on to his next question so long. Um, it is a general question about an appeal and whether we give it out or not out, there is a DRS review by a player and it comes out that our decision was wrong. Um, so we have, have distractions or shall we say disappointments because of this wrong decision. How do we feel at that moment, Abdullah, and how does it affect us for the next ball and subsequent overs when we have got a decision wrong and DRS has shown it to be wrong? Yes, Tom, I can relate to this. It happened a few weeks ago in a SA20 game uh, in Paul between the Sun Rises, uh, the Sun Rises Eastern Cape and the Paul Royals. Bjorn Fertain was bowling. He was on a hat-trick. Ma uh, Marco Janssen was batting. Struck the front pad. Phew. When it hit, it looked good to me. And I raised my finger. And um, Marco consulted his colleague. His colleague said to him, Marco, it looks good, good to me, but we have two reviews left. We might as well use it. So Marco went upstairs. Uh, with, when the R is in place, you are mic'd up, so you can follow the process by the TV umpire, and uh, visually as well, you, uh, there is a big screen, so everyone looks at the big screen. So you look at a big screen, you also follow uh, um, the process that the TV umpire is, uh, is going uh, through. So how do you feel? How do you feel at, at, at that moment? Uh, yeah, you do feel nervous. You look at the screen. That initial uh, before ball tracking comes up, um, it looked good. It said, oh, that looks good. I don't think it looks like it's missing. And then they go through ball tracking and then ball tracking came up and ball tracking actually shows the ball was, uh, was missing. So now, so now you see ball, uh, ball missing. So now if you, you, you're preparing yourself because now the TV umpire is going to come to you and say, um, Abdullah, you need to reverse your, your on-field decision of out to not out, stand by. So you now know the, the, the screen is going to, is going to um, the camera is going to be on you. So now you prepare yourself um, to overturn your, your decision and uh, I to uh, do this and do this, not out, overturn the decision. And... Um, so importantly now, now, yes, you know you've made a mistake, but not, not just at this level, at any level. Yes, you, you, you do feel bad. No one wants to make mis mistakes, but you need to teach yourself to put that behind you, to park it. You can uh, um, dissect it. You can discuss it. You can analyze it after the game. But now the, the next important thing is that next ball. You need to be in the zone for that very next ball. Why? Anything can happen that very next ball. You cannot be, you cannot be thinking, um, oh, how did I miss that? Oh, I should have given him not out. Oh, uh, no. You can think about it and uh, analyze it afterwards. Uh, yes, it comes with experience where you need to teach yourself, park, park it, it's done and dusted, nothing you can do about it now, focus on the next delivery, strong body language, uh, you know, the appeal might, there might be another appeal than the, uh, the, the next ball, so you need to Tell yourself that. Speak to yourself. So that's what I do. Speak to myself. You know, focus, focus. Put it behind you. Focus. Next delivery. Okay, focus. I go through my processes. I do have processes in place. I go through exactly the same processes for the next delivery. I, I forget it. Park it. Uh, uh, next delivery is the important thing. 
so so yeah it, it is important you need to park it anything can happen the very next ball and if you're still thinking about it if you still if you're still um, um, uh, chewing on that decision you will mess up the next one because you're not focused you're thinking on on your your pre your uh, the uh, previous ball so i parked it um, after the game we discussed it I analyzed it looked at the replays i, I spoke to the match referee um adrian Alstock was the tv uh, got his input we then dissected it and and we went through what went through your mind you know we dissected the decision i then analyzed it but this was in the debrief after the game but while that game is still going on you, um, you need to park it. That's the bottom line. Focus on the next delivery. You need, because anything can happen that very next ball, and you need to be, you need to be on top of your game. Over, Tom. Uh, thanks for that uh, experience, Abdullah. Um, I don't think anybody else on this particular chat has had a DRS review, uh, whether it was successful or unsuccessful. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, to, uh, and just to say the uh, the 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 opposite. So, <laughs> so, so there were other reviews as well, and now they were in that same game, and uh, it was successful. Now you go again. It was LB. You follow. You you um. Uh, it was a not out call, and and um you 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 follow the TV. You look at the screen, and you you can see front on. Oh, it looks like it's missing, but you're still hoping you're not you're not too sure. Now ball tracking comes up. You do hold your breath. <gasps> okay, please let it miss. I hope it miss. <laughs> I hope it misses. And then and then yes, Hawkeye shows it actually. Uh, it was clipping. Uh, okay, so it was clipping. So because my on-field decision was not out, so they stayed with a not out decision. And and again, you do not you're not supposed to show uh, any emotion or body language. But but I was like uh, inside of me going yes yes yes. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> okay, over Tom. Great stuff, Abdullah. And, and and just to finish on that, I think the, the great thing about DRS is that uh, once the this decision is reviewed players accept it and they move on uh, whether they were successful in their review or unsuccessful in their review at least there isn't that lingering debate as to whether or not the umpire got the decision wrong so i think it's very good for cricket and um as an umpire i don't know myself because i haven't been through it but I think you would also be able to park it easier because you have conclusive evidence whether your decision was correct or incorrect. Uh, so let's all try and get to the level where we are under DRS uh, reviews uh, so that we know whether our decisions are correct or incorrect. Next question is from Mark. If a batter tries to duck a bouncer, but the bouncer did not bounce high enough and hit him on the helmet, causing him to stumble or fall and break the stumps. Would he be out hit wicket or can the umpire try and call dead ball as soon as the ball hits the helmet before he stumbles onto his stumps? So that's quite a tricky one, Abdullah, because uh, player safety is always paramount in our decision making. Are we going to call dead ball because there is a possible serious injury to the batter as soon as the ball hits the helmet? Or are we going to wait until he falls on his stumps, in which case he's out, hit wicket, and then call dead ball for the medics to rush on? Tom, the law, the law um, gives us a bit of guidance here by telling us if a serious injury to a player, if there's a serious injury to a player and the emphasis is on a serious injury to a player. That, and again, that is uh, your judgment call as, as uh, the umpire. And for me, uh, an example of a serious injury to a player is a player getting hit uh, again, with the ball against the head, 
whether it's a bouncer hitting the bat, the, the striker, whether it's uh, silly point, uh, silly point um, uh, getting hit by a, a pull shot or a cut shot by, by the batter, the ball goes against uh, the helmet. Um, I see that as a serious injury to the, um, to the striker. So in this example, ball goes against the striker's head. Lord tell us, if you see a serious injury to a player, call and signal dead ball. So in this instance, I will try to protect the batter. I, I see that as a serious injury to the, to the striker. I will try to intervene as soon as possible by calling and signaling dead ball. So, so here your intervention is crucial. Try to call and signal dead ball as soon as possible. The, in the game that, I, that just finished today between the Warriors and, and the Knights, we actually had four concussion substitutes in the game. That's the most I ever had in the game. Sure. where players were actually substituted. There were, I think, about nine or ten occasions where we had to call the med the medics um, onto the field to do a concussion test. Uh, um, it was just, uh, it was a it was a, a bouncy pitch, and um, there were lots of bounce, and uh, it wasn't unplayable. There were, one team scored 400, there were um, 80s and 90s, um, uh, Matthew Brieske scored a ton, um, and there was 70, so it, it, it wasn't a, a snake pit, but there was lots of bounce um, uh, in the pit, and some of the, uh, the batters didn't play the short ball uh, that well. So, intervened, so it happened quite a few times in this match. As soon as I saw that ball hitting the helmet, I immediately intervened. Ball hit the helmet. A split second later, I didn't even look where the ball was going, what is happening. I immediately call and signal dead ball. My interpretation and the law guides us here, if a serious injury uh, to a player, call and signal dead ball. So I immediately call and signal dead ball. And anything, once you make that call, anything that happens after that is uh, irrelevant. So in this example, I will try to protect the batsman. I will, if I see that ball hit, hit the helmet, I will intervene as soon. I'll make that call as soon as possible by calling and signaling dead ball. So once you've made that call, the ball then becomes dead. If afterwards the, the striker then stumbles onto the, the stumps, the striker is protected by your call. The other flip side of the coin if you did not make that call, if you did not intervene as umpire, and either umpire can make this call, whether it's bowlers in or strikers in, if there was a delay and neither of the umpires call and signal dead ball, and then the striker stumbled onto the stumps, and now you call and signal dead ball, unfortunately that is too late. The striker in, in, in this example uh, will unfortunately be, have to be given out uh, hit wicket because your call of dead ball only uh, came off afterwards. So in your example, my advice is if the six split second it hits the helmet, call and signal dead ball. You protect the striker uh, from and, and anything that happens after that is irrelevant. Uh, over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Next question is from Eric, and I will take this one. It is to do with the ball becoming automatically dead when under law 24.4 we have a player returning to the field without permission of the umpires and coming into contact with the ball. Eric asks, is it one penalty run added and what is the signal used? Um, so Eric, it is not one penalty run added. It is five penalty runs awarded to the batting side. And even though the ball automatically becomes dead, when the player who has returned to the field without permission of the umpires comes into contact with the ball, it is good umpiring practice to call and signal dead ball. Why? Because not many players, if any, will know that the fielder came back onto the field without permission of the umpires and also not many players know that if this offense occurs that 
the ball becomes automatically dead. So call and signal dead ball and then signal five penalty runs to the batting side and the ball shall not count as one for the over. The runs completed before the player came into contact with the ball will count as well as the run in progress if they had crossed when the fielder came into contact with the ball. So Eric, I hope that answers your question. Then we have the measurement of the width of a pitch. Uh, quite a few of you answered the question. Uh, thank you to all of those who attempted it. It's always a good way to learn is by trying. And I see a few of you gave us some other measurements of the creases and not the pitch. Uh, 2.44 is not correct. That is the minimum length of the return crease. 2.12 meters, we all know, is the length of the pitch from middle stump to middle stump or from bowling crease to bowling crease. Um, 3.66 is the Minimum length of the pop increase. It's not the width of the pitch. And then um, Hitesh gave the correct answer. The first correct answer was actually given by an accounts receivable manager. Uh, your name is not on there, but your title is. So well done to you. And then quite a few people followed suit with the answer of 3.05 meters. And quite often you don't see the width of the pitch marked or indicated on the field. Um, in the West Indies, they commonly have uh, dotted lines at the end of each side of the pitch, uh, but it's essentially about 20 centimeters wide of both return creases. So if you remember that the return creases are 2.64 meters apart and then 3.05 minus 2.64 is um, 40.01 centimeters if my maths is not failing me. And so divide that by two and that is the distance from the return crease to the edge of the pitch on either side. Next question comes from Fassaj. When Shahid Afridi hit the roof, the umpire gave 12 runs. We just saw former Australian captain of the 50 over and the T20 side Aaron Finch hitting a roof, the roof in a Big Bash League match and the umpires awarded a dead ball. And here Fassaj talks about umpires awarding 12 runs for Shahida Freedy hitting uh, the roof. So ladies and gents, please remember that every competition has different playing conditions that overrule the laws. And obviously in this particular competition facades that Shahid Afridi was playing in. The playing conditions specified that if a player hits the roof, then they get 12 runs. So um, if the umpire was correct, that's what they gave. That must have been the playing condition. Okay. Next question is from Musa. Musa asks, what if the striker plays a ball that has not reached the striker. Is that allowed, Abdullah? Or are we going to call and signal no ball? Or are we going to call and signal dead ball if the striker plays a ball that has not reached the striker? Uh, maybe not reached the pop increase. So Tom, is this ball rolling or um, did it uh, did it uh, come to a stop before reaching the striker? 
because they, can... they said. Yeah, give us uh, both those scenarios, please, Tula. Okay, Musa, thanks for your question. Under the under the no ball law, so if the ball was delivered and the ball now starts rolling towards the striker, according to the no ball law, is the umpire to call and signal no ball. So if a scenario, the bowler bowls the ball, let's say the um, bowl, bowls it, the ball almost landed um, uh, on his on his uh, front foot, the uh, ball now starts rolling towards the strikers, if you can visualize that. So the law tells us if the ball, before reaching the popping crease, rolls towards the striker, either umpire to call and signal no ball. The other, if the the other um, option, if ball was delivered, the ball rolls towards the striker, but it actually stops before reaching the striker. In that case, either umpire to call and signal no ball, and immediately a split second later, call and signal dead ball. So the difference: the one is rolling, call and signal no ball. The other one. It rolled, but it actually stops. In that case, call and signal no ball, and a split second later, call and signal uh, dead ball. So, um, so I think this to further on. Uh, um, so, so Musa is perhaps asking, what if the striker now plays it? So, in the one scenario, if it rolls, there's nothing in the law that says that the striker cannot uh, eat it, but you will protect the striker by calling and signaling uh, no ball. So there's only three ways that the striker can be dismissed of that particular delivery. Whereas the other one, if it stops, come to a standstill, you'll call and signal no ball, but you then, a split second later, needs to call and signal dead ball. And in that case, once you've done call no ball and dead ball, the striker in the second scenario, um, after, after calling dead ball, anything that happens after that is irrelevant. So so basically the strikers uh, it's not allowed to hit the ball. Even if he hits it, uh, it wouldn't count because you've called and signaled dead ball. That's my interpretation of his question, Tom. 100% I agree with you, Tula. Thanks for that thorough explanation. Uh, the next few questions are to deal with the difference between a no ball and a wide for the ball bouncing over the striker. So again, let's remember that we are studying the laws of cricket, the 42 laws of cricket in the blue book. And Abdullah went through law 21 with us today. And one of the ways that a no ball is called according to law is if a short pitch delivery bounces above head height of the striker standing upright at the crease okay so if we are playing in a match where there are no playing conditions then there is a bouncer and the bouncer goes over head height of the striker standing upright at the crease. Uh, even if the striker plays at the shot uh, and misses, uh, or even plays as, at it and hits the ball above his or her head, the law tells us that we should call and signal no ball. Okay, that is law. However, there are playing conditions in international cricket, test match, one day internationals, and T20 internationals. All three of those formats, and we play this playing condition in our club cricket as well here at Western Province Cricket Association. All of the playing conditions I've ever umpired dictate that if a short pitch delivery bounces over a bowler's, uh, sorry, a 
the striker's head standing upright at the crease. And there is no contact with the bat or the person of the striker. Then you as umpires should call and signal wide. That is a playing condition all around the world. And you are also governed by your playing conditions as to how many short pitch deliveries you are allowed to bowl in and over. And in T20 internationals, and I'm going to speak about T20 internationals because there is a question about a delivery in a T20 Women's World Cup semi-final that I will answer. You are only allowed one short pitch delivery over shoulder height in a T20 international, okay? So now, if the ball pitches and bounces over head height in a T20 international and there is no impact or no contact with the bat or the person of the striker standing upright at the crease, then either umpire and the strikers and umpires at, in the best position to see how high the ball is, the strikers and umpire will signal to the bowlers and umpire that it should be a wide and the bowlers and umpire will signal the wide to the players first and then when the ball is dead will signal to the scorers and the bowlers and umpires will signal that that is the one allowable short pitch delivery in the over okay so now we have a question as to why Jamima Rodriguez was given out court when against Australia in the semi-final of the T20 Women's World Cup that has recently been completed here in South Africa, Jamima Rodriguez tried to play an uppercut above her head and instead got a thin edge to the ball and it was caught behind. So obviously if the ball hits the bat, it cannot be called wide. If the playing condition says that if a short pitch delivery bounces over a striker's head and there is no contact with the bat or person, as Abdullah described to us in his lectures about the wide, then the playing condition says we should call and signal wide. But we all know that we cannot call and signal wide if there is contact with the bat on the ball. So even though the ball was above Jamima Rodriguez's head height, because she made contact with the ball, it was not called a wide. It was merely called one short pitch delivery for the over. And because it was the first and only short pitch delivery in that over, she got bat on it. She was out court. If that match was not a T20 international and did not have a set of playing conditions, then we would look at the law as to how we judge that delivery. It was above her head. So law tells us that we should have called no ball for that particular delivery. But remember I told you that playing conditions over rule or override the law. So where there is a disagreement between a law and a playing condition, you always go with the playing condition. And the playing condition here is that a short pitch delivery overhead height is a wide, but a wide can only be called wide if there is no contact with the bat on the ball or the person on the ball. I hope that clarifies all the questions on the no ball versus the wide for a ball passing over the head of the striker standing upright at the crease. 
if there are any further questions, we will take them um, when we are done with all the questions in the chat box. Musa, I did ask you what you were referring to when you say does those runs count? Um, so hopefully lower down in the chat box, you have asked your question in full and then we'll be able to answer it. So I'm just going to go past all of the questions and comments about the ball bouncing over head height. There were quite a few of them. The next question is from SP. No, SP was answering an earlier question. The next question is from Pravin. Or I think he is still referring to the short pitched delivery, which I have explained. Sheena asks or comments, I can think of another. A fielder came back on the field without informing the umpire and came into contact with the ball in fielding it. Nine runs can be awarded. Uh, Sheena, it would be five penalty runs for the fielder returning to the field without permission from the umpires and coming into contact with the ball. Uh, but where would the other four runs come from? Um, so that's why I said the ball goes over the boundary first, which is four runs for the boundary, and then five penalty runs to the batting side for the fielding side, wasting time after they were given a first and final warning. Ladies and gents, I think it would be easier for all of us if you did not try to answer the questions put into the chat box uh, because your answers are not always correct. And it also just adds uh, a lot of questions or a lot of comments unnecessarily to the chat box. Johan B asks, considering that the wicketkeeper is not allowed to catch the ball in front of the stumps. Why was Mohammed Rizwan stumping against Dinesh Kartik given out despite handling the ball in front of the stumps? Uh, this was the famous T20 World Cup match in Australia at a jam packed Melbourne cricket ground. I think it was that famous final over where absolutely everything happened. Abdullah, India versus Pakistan. Do you remember how Dinesh Kartik was out? Uh, I will take you through it, no problem. Um, so Dinesh Kartik tried to uh, play a shot uh, against uh, the sweeper, uh, against a spinner, and the ball uh, ricocheted off Dinesh Kartik's Kartik's uh, pads, if I remember correctly, he did not know where the ball was and left his crease uh, or he double stepped and then the ball hit the pad and then the uh, wicket keeper collected the ball in front of the stumps and stumped uh, DK out, uh, legally so. Why was it legal? We will deal with it in detail in Law 27, the Wicket Keeper. But in short, the Wicket Keeper is allowed to come in front of the stumps um, if the batter has made contact with the ball, A, with his bat, or B, with his or her person. Um, there is a third condition, Abdullah. Uh, please remind me what that third condition is. Uh, if the batter attempts a run. If the batter attempts a run, the wicket keeper can also come past the stumps to collect the ball or try and field the ball. So that is why um, the stumping was allowed, even though the 
uh, wicketkeeper came in front of the stumps, it's because the ball had come off Dinesh Kartik's pads. As soon as the ball hits the pads or any part of the striker, the wicketkeeper is allowed to come in front of the stumps and will not be no balled. Okay, uh, SP, thanks you for sharing your experience about DRS, Abdullah. So um, please keep those experiences coming. Uh, SP has got another scenario here. I'm trying to make sense of it, SP. I, I can't really reading it quickly. If you can raise your hand if you are still with us and um, unmute your microphone to talk us through this scenario about the imaginary line joining the middle stump and the bowler's end calling no ball for bouncing more than once. Um, are we going to call no ball more than a few times? Is that what you're asking? Um, I'm not too sure. Um, Abdullah, have you read through those scenarios? Can you make sense of SP's question there? No, Tom, I'm not able to make any sense. Okay. Uh, the, uh, one thing that pops up is um, what I may be thinking is, is it the bowlers in umpire's call or is it strikers in umpire's call? That's the only thing I can think of. Okay, if um, SP is no longer with us on today's chat, I will try and uh, get a hold of him on email to clarify that question and we can uh, deal with it next week, Monday's lecture. Next question is from Fassage. The batter hits the shot and catch the ball. Unfortunately, he is damaged. I think this is the bowler. So is that out or dead ball? Um, I think the batter hit the ball very hard back at the bowler and the bowler caught the ball but was seriously injured at the same time. Abdullah, um, out court or dead ball or both? So for Saad, uh, this is a, a judgment call that the umpire needs to make when it comes to uh, if an incident happens on the field and there is a, a serious injury to uh, to either player or um, or umpire. And you need to make that judgment call as the umpire, and you need to make uh, you need to make that particular particular call. So trying to visualize uh, your um, uh, your scenario um, so tom is he saying the ball gets it straight to the bowler let's say it, it goes against the head and goes up and then gets gets caught or uh, um you could just maybe visually uh, try to to come up with this scenario it, it sounds like the Better hit the ball straight back at the bowler, but very hard. Yeah. The yeah. bowler initially catches the ball, yeah. and then he uses the word ball popped. So I'm thinking he might have dropped the ball because of the pain inflicted by the ball on him. So um, in my mind, Abdullah, he didn't have control of the mm. ball. Um and so that would be not out. And then if it is a serious injury, you would still call and signal dead ball. Uh, as we went through the, um, we will go through the catch law in the lecture six next week, Wednesday. Uh, and it was mentioned, I think, in the animation video on boundary catches that both the Fielder has to be in control of both the ball and his or her movements for a catch to be complete. And in this case, it does not sound like the bowler had control of the ball for long enough, uh, nor of his or her movements. 
Uh, Fasaj, if uh, we are getting your scenario confused, uh, please raise your hand and we will let you describe it to us uh, live. The next two... Hello. Yes, Fasaj, please go ahead. My question, my question is, what, the batsman has hit the ball, then fielder was catched, then the ball was broken. He's the umpire saying that ball is broken. I mean, popped or damaged. The ball after became, the catch. The ball became damaged after the yeah. catch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll see. Then we'll see uh, see the uh, umpire or the ball is damaged or cat, uh, the broken. So what is the umpire decision? Uh, did the fielder have control of the ball and also of his or her movements when they caught the ball? After the ball, caught the ball. Does the fielder have control of the ball? Yes. Okay, so the fielder did not drop the ball. No, no. Okay, then that is a fair catch and the batter is out court. And at the fall of any wicket, the ball is given to the umpires. So then the umpire will notice that the ball is damaged. It has split in half whatever the case might be, and then they can change the ball and they will replace it, as Abdullah mentioned in Law 4, they will replace it with a ball of equal wear and tear, but of course one that is not torn or uh, ripped or popped, as you have mentioned. Okay, so definitely out court and no need to call and signal dead ball in that case, for such. I hope that answers your question. Last question is also from Fassage. The batter has been dismissed, but has asked for a DRS review. Uh, while the DRS review is going on, the batsman leaves the field and it ends up that the TV umpire reverses the decision and gives the batter not out. But now the batsman has left the field, Abdullah. He has crossed the boundary and is off the field of play. What is the final umpire's decision? Is that batter out or can he come back onto the field? Uh, Tom, I'm going to answer this question in, in two parts. Firstly, I'm going to cover what the law say. And then secondly, uh, uh, practically uh, in a DRS game, I'm going to cover uh, if it's if DRS is in place, and obviously it's a televised game. And um, I'm going to uh, cover a bit of uh, field graph. This will be four umpires and, and what the procedure is when there is a DRS review. But so let's kick off with what the law say. The law tell us uh, that if a bat, uh, the as long as as long as the next ball has not been bowled, so that's the important part here. The next ball should not have been bowled. That's the important part. Then, uh, then the the batter can come back and bat. So even if the bat, the batter left the field, even if the batter went into the dressing room. And now get called back. As long as that next ball has not been bowled, that batter can come back to continue his or her innings. If the next ball was bowled, then unfortunately that batter is then uh, dismissed. So just to summarize then the law, as long as the next ball has not been bold, but we will cover this under under uh, appeals, and we will go into more more detail. But just the crux here is, even if you left the, the the field, went into the dressing room, crucial part is the next ball should not have been bold. Under under DRS, these are usually it's a televised game, so there are four umpires at any televised game. 
two on field. There's the TV umpire and there's also a fourth umpire. So part of the duties of a fourth umpire is the fourth umpire usually sits close to the the, the dugouts of, of, of both teams. And if there is a DRS re review, even if the batsman thinks he or she is, uh, is out and wants to leave the field, the fourth umpire will stop the the um, dismissed batter in inverted commas, will stop the batter from leaving the field of play until the DRS review has been completed. And once the, the uh, review is completed, whether it's out or not out, then the fourth umpire will allow the batter then to, to leave the field of play. And if the batter's out, leave the field of play for the new batter to come in. But the bottom line is the fourth umpire will stop the the um, the batter. Even the batter feels you see uh, is out until that review is finished. Only then will the the batter be allowed to leave the field of play. Over, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Tula. And that brings us to the end of our questions in the chat box. Thank you very much for all of those. They were very interactive and I think we all learned something new today. Are there any other questions on the material covered this evening or the uh, admin of the exam or the course? Uh, if not, I want to thank you all for your participation this evening and we shall reconvene again next week, Monday, 6 p.m. South African time. I will be sending a link of the recording of this lecture in a couple of hours time this evening and I will see you all again next week, Monday. Vaughn, is that you saying goodbye or is that you raising your hand to ask a question? You can either wave good night, <laughs> okay, and have a good evening further. Is that over and out? You've got a question, then unmute your microphone. No question. <laughs> Thank you very no, much. No, please. A question, question, please. Go for it, Vaughn. Um, good evening, good evening, sir. Sir Abdullah, Sir Tom. Um, I actually have just uh, two questions, uh, sir. Is that with regards to the video, the video you showed with uh, Ben Stokes, where he, where the ball um, was thrown against his, uh, uh, his bed. Um, as I'm, as I'm being told, the Empire is a final say. But uh, when I do watch cricket, um, anything like on the field can be reviewed, can be asked. Like, say the, the fielding team has a review. Can the fielding team then review that uh, um, where the empire says it's six runs? Does the fielding captain have the option to review and send it up to the to the third empire to review it? It's my first question. And my second question would be, if I may, um, if uh, if the bowling team, if they take long with their overrate, they can must be fined with their overrate. So with what you just said now, sir, with regards to a batsman. So now if the batsman do leave the field and it is being reviewed and he left the field, he went up to the dressing room um, for wasting time. Can his team also then be fined for wasting time, sir? Two very good questions, Vaughan. Um, we've got our DRS expert here, Abdullah, who will uh, tell us what teams are allowed to review for and what they are not allowed to review for. That's your first question, Abdullah. Yeah, so Vaughan, at uh, the International Cricket Council, uh, they govern international um, uh, uh, cricket. 
And I'm now referring to the national cricket where the ODS is in place. Yes, I know there are some uh, um, competitions around the world with IPL, SA, SA20, where BBL with the ODS also in place, but the, similar, the same process uh, um, is applicable. But I'll use ICC as an example. They have playing conditions that they set in place that guides the umpires what is allowed to, uh, to be reviewed and what is not allowed to be reviewed. So there you'll get, uh, you get umpire, umpire reviews, you get pl um, player reviews, so umpire reviews, um, like stumping, uh, a run out to check whether the bowler is bold. Those are the type of umpire reviews that are allowed. Player player reviews that are that are allowed to be to, uh, to be challenged uh, um, or umpires decisions that are allowed to be challenged. Whether it's LBW, whether it's um, uh, court, the playing conditions guide us. Uh, players are allowed to ch if the is in place. Um, to challenge uh, decisions made uh, by umpire. So they'll tell us specifically, yes, if a decision gets made, whether it's RBW or, or, or court or whatever, um, players are allowed to challenge. Umpire reviews are also allowed, stumping, runouts, uh, hit the wickets, uh, bowls, those are also allowed. So they, they do put specifically what is allowed and what is uh, what is what is allowed. There's lots of things that's not allowed, like say if, for say for argument's sake, the fielding captain feels that the ball, uh, uh, the umpire calls wide. The fielding captain's uh, the fielding captain feels yeah, but the ball is it, uh, uh, is not wide. The fielding captain cannot go to the umpire and say, I am challenging that. I don't think it's a wide. Can you please ask the TV umpire to go have a look at it? No, and uh, the, the current uh, playing conditions and protocols. Those are that's just one example of of uh, things that is uh, that is not al allowed. So basically, just the things that are allowed uh, is um, decisions that get challenged, umpire reviews where umpires needs to to make sure of of certain things. Again, different competitions allow uh, different things uh, to be reviewed. In the SA20, there were certain things that we were allowed to review that's actually not allowed at international uh, uh, um, at international level. Um, the, just one example, um, no ball height, full tosses. If you look at an international uh, a game, look at it uh, uh, like at a, at a T20, only upon this missile can, can on field go up to the TV umpire to check whether the ball is above waist height or not. That is an ICC regulation and that is um, as per the airplane condition, only upon this missile. In the SA20, the playing condition stated that Anything above waist high can, if the umpires just needs to make certain, they can go up to the TV umpire. So just the point I'm trying to make is in the SA20 competition, uh, their playing conditions allowed for, for those things to be reviewed. Under ICC playing conditions, it's only allowed upon uh, dismissal. So yes, it can differ from competition to competition. Uh, but in summary, you get guided by the playing condition, what is allowed to be reviewed and what's not allowed to be uh, reviewed. Uh, over Tom, did I answer the question? Did I answer your question, Vaughan? You've got a thumbs up from Vaughan there, so his first question has been answered. Uh, second question was, if the batter goes off the field and is subsequently judged not out by the DRS review and wastes three minutes to come back on, um, is the fielding team going to get penalized or is the batting side going to get penalized and potentially fined? for slow overrates there, Abdullah? Yeah, so so practically, Vaughan, as I explained with the, with uh, in televised games with fourth umpires in place, practically this won't happen, but uh, but let's just say for argument's sake, uh, it happened and, and they do want to waste, waste time and they do go up to the dressing room to to waste time for, for whatever reason. I can't see, think of a reason in a T20 game that you want to waste that you want to waste time. Usually it's in, in, in test cricket, bad light or that you do want to waste time. But just say for arguments sake, you do want to waste time. There are playing conditions uh, in place. If the 
Batting side do waste time. The fielding side will not be penalized. That those three minutes that the batters wasted will actually be added to the batters' uh, time allowances. Uh, um, and if they are in breach, or if after it gets added to their to, to their time, and they uh, um, they are be, um, slow with their overrates, there are penalties that are imposed. So um, just depending on the blowing conditions, it can be monetary, it can be points get deducted, it can be it can be both. Did I answer your question, Vaughn? Thank you very Over much, time. sir. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Over, Tom. Vaughn, thank you very much.